Hey everybody, this is a summary of our week 12 and 13 lectures on ergogenic aids and how they can affect performance. Uh, this lecture focused on caffeine, creatine, carnitine, pyruvate, and taurine. We'll touch on each of those, but we won't go into as much detail as we cover in class, um, just because we want to keep this within a reasonable time frame. Now, the story of an ergogenic aid is pretty much the same, no matter what ergogenic aid you're talking about. Does it have a whole body effect, and can it jump all of the hurdles required to have an effect at the muscle or whatever the target tissue is? So we approach an ergogenic aid from this standpoint. First of all, when you ingest it, is it broken down in the mouth? Uh, is it broken down in the saliva? Does it make it into the gut, and is it broken down by the stomach acid? If it makes it through the stomach, is it broken down in the intestines or are there transporters for it in the intestines? Um, does it need to be transported or can it be passively moved from the intestines into the bloodstream? After the intestines, is it broken down by the liver? Um, the liver is a massive filter that gets first crack in any nutrients that are coming into our body. Um, so will it be affected by the liver? If it bypasses the liver, does it get into the blood? Do we see a spike in the blood? Is it sustained? How long does it last for? Uh, is it broken down in the blood? There are enzymes in the blood that can break down compounds as well. If it's in the blood, does it stay in the blood or does it get filtered up by the kidneys? Um, the kidneys regulate a lot of substances in the blood too, so they might remove whatever the ergogenic aid is before it can get to the muscle. Um, if, however, it does get to the muscle, can it be taken up by the muscle? Are there transporters of the muscle? It's not likely that a substance will diffuse into the muscle just because it's so tightly regulated, uh, but certainly are there transporters for it? Does it get in? Does it accumulate? And can it have an effect on metabolism? Overall, does it affect whole body performance? So there's a lot of areas that uh, these ergogenic aids need to um, need to work through in order to have an effect on performance. Now, as we saw in one of the papers, and we'll talk about that in a second, it doesn't have to go through all these um, hoops in order to have an effect on performance. I'm thinking specifically about carbohydrate having an effect directly at the mouth. So, um, more on that in just a second. Now, we talked about some whole body effects of ergogenic aids, and this is pretty much how you would test any ergogenic aid um, that you were presented with or that you wanted to see effects on. You really measure the effects at a whole body level first to see if it's worth going more invasive and taking blood samples and looking at the muscle. Um, so we saw that in three groups that were performing resistance training, um, three groups were given the same amount of energy in these three different supplements, but one group was given creatine. And the group that was given the creatine over the course of the training program saw an increase in strength, lean body mass, cross-sectional area, contractile protein that was greater than the other two groups. So the addition of creatine had this extra stimulus, um, allowed you to get an extra benefit from resistance exercise training over and above the protein or the protein carb groups only. So there is a whole body effect and we can go into the muscle. There's rationale here to go into the muscle and see what's going on or go into the blood, see where the effects lie. Now, interestingly, in this study, there's no change in muscle creatine and simply put, that shouldn't happen. An increase in muscle creatine is what should give you the ability to work at a higher level and uh, gain more strength, gain more lean body mass, gain more contractile protein. But in this study, there was no change in muscle creatine with creatine supplementation. It could be the sampling time points or the analysis, but this is really an anomaly. We saw another study with whole body effects after nitrate supplementation. So uh, dietary nitrate comes from beetroot juice or spinach. And when you ingest this acutely, VO2 at a given workload is decreased. So VO2 goes down and at a higher intensity, time to exhaustion is, is prolonged, it's improved. 
So there are a whole body effects of dietary nitrate supplementation, and now we're um, justified in taking muscle biopsies and blood samples to see what exactly is going on. <clears throat> now the one study that I alluded to a few slides ago um, that bypassed or that didn't have to jump through all the hurdles in order to have an er ergogenic effect is this study by Carter where mouth rinsing with a carbohydrate solution improved performance versus mouth rinsing with a placebo. This is really cool because there's no ingestion there's no worry about carbohydrate getting into the blood or the muscle. All the effects happen at the mouth, and there's some stimulatory effect of carbohydrate in the mouth that tricks the brain into thinking the work is easier or tricks the brain into thinking that it's getting fuel and allows you to work at a higher level. So overall in these groups, it was a pretty neat study because they blinded them to carbohydrate or placebo by using maltodextrin, which is colorless and tasteless and should ideally uh, be the same as a water placebo. So the subjects ideally couldn't tell that there was carbohydrate in the drink, even though a couple of them did. Um, but that doesn't matter because when you take their data out and look at it on its own, their performance time difference is still the same as the performance time difference here. There's no extra effect, no placebo effect guessing that you had carbohydrate. So, mouth rinsing with carbohydrate improves performance. They tried to blind them successfully. Really cool stuff shows that there's an effect at the mouth, just at the mouth, which is kind of, kind of impressive. Now, with respect to the ergogenic age that we were talking about, we led with pyruvate. Um, this is one substrate that we thought could activate PDH, which is a mitochondrial enzyme which might allow us to oxidize more carbohydrate and possibly improve performance. Or we might be able to use this directly as energy because as you see on this slide, pyruvate sits in the middle um, at the nexus of carbohydrate oxidation in the cytosol and the entry of that carbohydrate into the mitochondria at the bottom. So if we can get more pyruvate in here, maybe we can push more carbohydrate through uh, by activating PDH, or maybe we can use that as an energy source itself. Now py uh, pyruvate was one of those supplements that showed no effects at all. There's no change in plasma or in whole blood pyruvate concentration, regardless of what dose you used. Now this doesn't mean that there won't be an effect. Um, so whole body time trial whole body time trial performance was measured or time to exhaustion sorry and with placebo or pyruvate there's no difference in the ability of these cyclists to exercise at 75 to 80% VO2 max until exhaustion so just because there was no change in plasma or blood pyruvate we saw with carbohydrates that doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be an effect maybe pyruvate has an effect on the mouth who knows? But this whole body measure really hammers home that there is no effect of supplementing with pyruvate, at least acutely. Our second supplement that we looked at was carnitine. Carnitine is uh, a factor that helps transport fat into the mitochondria. So we thought that maybe there would be an enhanced free fatty acid transport. Um, maybe that would result in an increased fatty acid oxidation, allowing us to spare muscle glycogen during exercise. Or possibly, maybe that allows us to increase time to exhaustion or increase um, self-selected workload during exercise. Now carnitine, just to put it into perspective, helps push fat across the mitochondrial membrane, which you can see here. There's a whole complex that um, attaches a fat to a carnitine moves it into the mitochondria, and then attaches the fat back to acetyl-CoA, which is the activator molecule. So if we can add more carnitine, that's outlined there in green, maybe we can push more substrate through um, into the mitochondria. As it turns out, this is um, data showing muscle carnitine concentration. We did see an increase in plasma carnitine concentration, around 30 to 50%. So that initially looked promising, but there's no change in muscle carnitine concentration. For some reason, the muscle ignores the increase in plasma carnitine. 
on top of this, there's no change in fat oxidation and there's no change in performance. So what initially seemed promising with short carnitine supplementation um, really turns out to be a wash. There's no effect of carnitine, uh, at least on the short term, for muscle metabolism, fat oxidation, or performance. But we saw that chronic supplementation could improve performance. Now by chronic supplementation, I mean 24 weeks, which is huge, six months. It increases muscle carnitine content, as you can see on the right, and that really is only apparent after 24 weeks. And that coincides with an increase in performance during an all-out 30-minute exercise bout. So remember, these studies were set up where uh, the subjects would exercise for 30 minutes at 50%, 30 minutes at 80%, and then do a 30-minute time trial. And that's the result that I'm showing here, the time trial data only. So there is an increase in the amount of work done in the time trial, but might not be worth it considering the, the time and investment required to get to 24 weeks of supplementing with carnitine. So it does seem like carnitine can have an effect, but it's not an acute thing. It really needs time and effort uh, uh, put behind it to supplement with this um, nutrient in order to um, increase performance. Now what about taurine? Taurine is a, uh, a molecule that gets thrown into a lot of energy drinks nowadays. Um, some people claim that it reduces the rating of perceived exertion or it might help transport glucose into the cell, which might help us spare muscle glycogen because we're using that instead, that glucose from the blood. Overall though, we also wanted to see does it improve time to exhaustion or work performed during an exercise bout. So, now initially, one study that was conducted looked at taurine supplementation and its effects after 90 minutes of exercise at 65% VO2 max, followed by a time trial. And that time trial performance, which was around 25 minutes or so, did not change with taurine or with a placebo. So there wasn't a whole body effect on performance, even though it seems like that bar is slightly elevated, wasn't significant. But what was interesting is that fat oxidation increased during the 90 minutes of cycling. So there's a 14% increase in fat oxidation in the taurine group only, which is somewhat promising. I mean, people might want to use taurine to supplement to help increase fat oxidation because that's what a lot of people exercise in order to accomplish. So modest increases in taurine, or sorry, in fat oxidation with taurine, no increases in fat oxidation with a placebo or with a placebo when subjects thought they were getting taurine, which is placebo too. So no placebo effect. Now this gives us a bit of rationale or a bit of justification to look further into the mechanisms behind this. And so we did just that. Looking at taurine in the blood, there is an increase in taurine in the blood and you can build on that by repeatedly dosing taurine. But there is no change in muscle taurine concentration. So even though we get these massive spikes in taurine in the blood, which are akin to supplementing with creatine and creatine loading, the muscle resists this increase in plasma taurine. So there's no uptake for some reason. Which doesn't really bode well for fat oxidation um, that we saw in the last study. And in fact, we saw that seven days of taurine supplementation didn't change taurine in the muscle and didn't change fat oxidation during a two hour ride at 65% VO2 max. So it could have been an artifact of the RER measurements or the calculation for fat oxidation, but really there's no effect of taurine at the muscle. 